All right, well, we're going to get started with today's DSU Extension Agriculture Challenges webinar. Our topic today is challenges associated with unharvested corn. As we all know, there's a lot of corn out, of, out in the fields yet across the state. And so what are some of the ramifications of that? Um, issues with harvest and um, challenges if you choose to leave that in the field until next spring. Our first speaker today is going to be Joel Ransom, the Extension Agronomist here in Fargo. All right, you'll let me share, okay. Uh, how, how am I doing? Perfect. You can see. Okay, so I'll give a, a short introduction to uh, some of the issues associated with unharvested corn and and there have been presentations earlier this week that have dealt with uh, uses of, of corn other than for grain uh, in the market, uh, for livestock, et cetera. And uh, our focus on today is really just to speak about what we do with uh, wet corn that's unharvested, that's intended for the uh, grain market. So in the last crop, Crop update, 10% uh, of the corn had been harvested. Uh, that was on Tuesday that report came out and that compares to 60%. So we're obviously behind and there's a lot of corn out there. I think field access to, to rain and snow has been one of the issues, but also because of the very high grain moisture level, I think growers have been interested in trying to uh, see if they can get some of that out of there before they move it into the to storage then harvest and I suppose also they've been very occupied with harvesting uh, soybeans. But uh, high grain moisture levels this year at this point have been associated with both late planting and uh, law, a cold summer so we were far behind on growing degree days and I think we're all aware that there's been very little dry in the last two months due to wet and cold weather. So we got hammered in the summer. We had immature corn come our first killing frost in many cases. And then uh, we had lousy weather for drying that down. There are some positive with corn relative to some of the other uh, crops that are out there. Uh, first, I would say that the yields are relatively good. I mean, this is not going to be in every place in every of, of the state, but uh, our trials that we've harvested to date have averaged 220 bushels. So, you know, that's not perhaps as high as some of our uh, previous years, but it's certainly a respectable kind of yield. And I expect that many farmers are, are uh, in that same ballpark, uh, being maybe just slightly below some of their, their average yields. I think in most cases the stock strain's been very good, so there should be a little risk of lodging or eardrop, and those are concerns as, you, uh, as, as harvests are delayed. And of course, uh, of the crops that are out there, probably corn is the, more, the easiest to harvest when there's snow and in cold weather, the, the ear that is the focus of the harvest is up above the ground, and, and so that's also a positive. So I wanted to just show you, this is some data from one of the uh, uh, trials that we pulled off a few days ago at Ransom County to show you the kinds of moisture levels that at least we were dealing with. And uh, in that hybrid trial we had from 88 to 100 day relative maturities. It was uh, planted, I believe, on the 10th of May. So um, certainly on the earlier side of, of uh, some of the planting of corn in the state, and you can see from these data that we have moistures uh, anywhere between about 25 and 36. Obviously, the the stuff that's in 30 uh, above 34 it probably did not reach physiological maturity, um, and uh, got a long way to go to get things dry to a reasonable level. Uh, test weight is a concern when you have immature corn, uh, and so I pulled off these data and I did uh, dry these down before I took the data. So they have been, these are not the wet uh, test weights for the wet corn, this is actually dry corn. They may be a little better than this, and you can comment on, on this can as well, but uh, we actually 
I think these were about eight or ten percent moisture when we finished drying. We don't have a good way to dry it just to our storage moisture, so uh, they might be a little bit higher than this. But basically, uh, it looks like even the most immature corn uh, came in at about 50 pounds or above. Uh, so uh, that's, I think, that's not super news, but it means that in many cases the corn was mature and there's reasonable uh, test weight out there. Now this is a slide I borrowed from Ken, Dr. Hellevang, and uh, I think the point here is if you look on the uh, left-hand column of equilibrium moisture content, you know, that's the, the moisture content that the grain will uh, reach as it uh, is subject to the weather. And um, so in the cold weather, obviously, it is not going to dry much below that 21% out in the field. And then on the far right hand side, you can look at the amount of drying one can expect during the uh, winter months. And you can see that uh, this is uh, percent moisture loss per week, uh, that there's very little drying that occurs in November, December, January, and February. And maybe just to reinforce that point, I have some data from uh, some hybrids that we monitored in 2007. And if you look at the data, oh, look at kind of the chart beginning at the, the end of October, uh, you can see that that line becomes pretty flat, even though, you know, we're not talking about 30% moisture at this point. Uh, all of these hybrids came down to about, well, uh, you know, in the, in the mid 20s. Uh, but basically from the 11th of, of November to the end when we uh, took a break for Thanksgiving, it looks like we quit uh, measuring moisture. Uh, that uh, drop was, was pretty minimal. So one of the options that we want to touch on today would be what about uh, since we got wet corn out there, uh, the value is not as high uh, as we would like. Uh, there are costs associated with drying it, you know, maybe one of the options is that we keep it over winter. And that's uh, have a lot of farmers that have a lot of experience with this in the state. Unfortunately, it'd be nice that uh, this wouldn't have to be a decision. So I have a list of things that one might consider before they um, make that decision. And, you know, I, I think the first one leading the pack might be, you know, insurance issues. I don't have any expertise in that regard, but I know that insurance co coverage is likely to end soon. And uh, that could be a, a significant uh, item to consider. The other would be more on the biological side. What does the stock strength, the ear health, uh, is there insect damage, shank attachment, is it pretty strong? Is it likely to, to stand up during the winter months? And as I mentioned previously, in most of the state where we haven't had any drought or those kinds of issues that uh, I would say that uh, stock strength, ear health, and shank attachment strength is, is very good. I think another, act, another thing to consider would be deer activity. If you're in an area where you get lots and lots of deer walking through, I would certainly consider that as a potential loss mechanism. And then you're going to weigh that against the drying costs and your capabilities. I know that many growers uh, don't have uh, high capacity grain drying facilities and so uh, that makes uh, this decision challenging as well. And then I think uh, we want to also consider that uh, corn that's out there is going to impact spring work and that will carry on uh, to impact your operations next year so that also would be a reasonable consideration. So what happens uh, with the grain that's out there? Um, what kind of moisture loss? As I, I think I alluded to earlier that there's very little drying capacity in the air during November, December, January and this is some data that we collected from a field in Steele County in 2009 and you can it bears it out pretty well that we really don't see much moisture loss until we get into probably early March. Uh, and we actually, when we harvested uh, this field, it was down to 
uh, 13%. So uh, that was a positive in that regard. These are some data out of Wisconsin. Five-year average is a little more robust data set. And you can see again, December, January, not much movement in the moisture. Uh, they're probably a little warmer than we are here and they started to see some moisture loss in February, March, it picked up and then by April, it was very, very dry. So what kind of yield losses are likely to occur from leaving corn in the field? Uh, this is some data uh, published out of Wisconsin, a, a nice data set. And then look at the red bar, you'd see that, you know, over the, the course of the winter, they lost less, uh, probably on average, about 10% of their yield. And, and then 2002, which turned out to be a year with a lot of blowing snow and, and other issues that they had yield losses up to about 60%. Now the one field that I monitored over a year, it wasn't a high yielding uh, field. It was a farmer's field that we just sampled during the winter months. And, and uh, in that particular case, I did not see a single ear loss in the areas that we sampled. I mean, we're not talking about a whole field, uh, but uh, um, it stood up at uh, the, the ears stayed attached and, and, and there wasn't any loss uh, during the time that we monitored it. Okay, so I did a little survey on one of my talks a few years ago and just asked farmers that had kept uh, corn over the, the winter what kind of losses they thought they, they had they occurred. And from this, you can see 20% uh, thought that there was no noticeable loss. We had a third that thought about 5%. And then we have, what, about 50% uh, 56% that uh, would 10% or more, and, and included in that group was 20% that thought they lost more than 20%. Um, I asked about uh, what were the major causes, and uh, a third thought that deer, so I mean, if you're in an area where you don't have much deer activity, this, this would be a positive. Uh, lodge plants, 20%, teardrop, about a third, and rotten ears, about 20%. Again, I don't, I don't know as if we have a lot of rotten ears out there, although we did have a lot of moisture during uh, grain filling that uh, uh, could potentially have, have got some disease started. So in conclusion, I think concurrently, I would say there's a reason, reasonably good crop of corn still in the field, 90% of our crop, a lot of, a lot of acres this year. That is very wet. Uh, drying weights will be minimal for the winter months. Um, harvesting corn in the spring may be a good option, but uh, I would say carefully consider stock quality, risks of losses, spring challenges, and insurance issues, and uh, hopefully we'll address many of those as we continue on with the seminar. Okay. I'll hand it back to you, Miranda. <laughs> or did you want me to introduce the next? You can go ahead and introduce the next speaker if you'd like. Um, Dave Franzen, are you on? I don't see that he's joined us yet. So maybe Ken, go ahead and you pick up. No voice. Ken, you're muted. We'll try it again. There you go. And then we'll go to the presentation mode. And are you seeing it? Can you see my slide? Not yet. No. Okay, let's try this again. We got it. Okay. I'll start out uh, with kind of covering some of what I did uh, 
on Wednesday for those that listened in on Wednesday, but focus just on, on corn today. Uh, one of the things that comes up as an issue with, with corn is with these high moisture contents, we can get enough, uh, I call it surface moisture on the kernels that they will tend to freeze together and not flow. Uh, not a lot of research out there that, that indicates what that uh, value would be. Uh, I did some work on that area and then asked a lot of questions from, from farmers. Uh, with 28% moisture corn, I can be assured that if it is above freezing going into the bin, uh, that with that moisture content, the kernels will freeze together and not flow back out. If we're in the 24 to 25% moisture range, uh, there seemed to be some bindings. They still didn't flow well. Uh, you had to get under about 24% to assure the, that the kernels would flow. It was also impacted by foreign material. So the more foreign material, uh, the more likely that you were gonna have flowability problems. Now, the experience in 2009 was that if we had corn that was, let's say, 20 degrees going into the bin, it stayed at 20 degrees, uh, that it would flow back out. So it, it's when the temperature gets to the point that it, it's an issue. We've had a fair amount of experience with the uh, grain bags. Uh, again, going back to our experience in 2009, <clears throat> if we were in that 25 to 35% moisture range, <clears throat> excuse me, if we uh, went in frozen and kept it cold, it worked okay. However, if it was warm, there would be any uh, some in siling taking place. And, and even the corn that kept cold, guys were reporting that there was some odor associated with it, but once they got the corn out and started handling it, it seemed to be okay. 15 to 24 percent moisture, uh, probably more than 20 to 24 percent moisture is an area that concerns me uh, because there is the potential for heating occurring. We have no ability to aerate it or control the temperature at all. Uh, so it really needs to go in cold, stay cold, uh, and be removed uh, during the cold of the winter. Anything that's going to go into the spring where we start having warmer temperatures really needs to be down in that 13% moisture range. Uh, the bags do not prevent mold growth or insect infestation. Uh, they should be run north and south so that we have even solar heating on the two sides. Uh, select an elevated location so that you get some drainage. Monitoring is critical uh, in taping any openings that occur. Uh, and it really should be, I think, thought of as, as a winter storage. <clears throat> so if we're in that 25 to 30% moisture range, uh, Maybe rather than putting it into a bin, we should think of uh, piling the corn where we can mechanically uh, load and unload that corn. Uh, but I just remind people that even at 40 degrees, we have less than a month of storage time. So the ability to aerate it and keep it cool uh, becomes critical. And we really need to think of drying that by sometime by early February. If we're on the lower end of the 20s, 22 to 24%, we can put it into a bin, probably, again, cool to 20 degrees, hold it over winter, and maybe we can hold that until March uh, before we would need to absolutely have it dry. Anytime we're moving air through these bins uh, at temperatures near or below freezing, there's a real danger of icing over the bin vents. Uh, and then it's critical that, that to not damage the bin, that we have the fill hole and the access 
door open to work as a pressure relief valve. Uh, there are a few bins that are set up with pressure sensors so that they'll shut the fans off, but those are, are not very common. If we're using a, a typical farm moisture meter, uh, we need to keep in mind that those are calibrated for 15% moisture corn. Anytime we get to high moisture corn in the 25% moisture range or higher, that uh, there's going to be an error associated with that measurement. Also, temperature uh, impacts the reading uh, and there I recommend referring to the, the operator's manual, looking at what the operating range of that unit is. Many of them are not accurate below about 40 degrees. Any moisture variation across the kernel also will fool the meter. So if we're either coming out of a dryer or any condensation potential, uh, that's going to cause an error. I recommend putting the sample in a sealed container, letting it sit for six to 12 hours, warming to room temperature, and then rechecking that moisture. Running through a high temperature dryer uh, is a much slower process when we're doing it at, at 27, 28% moisture content. So uh, sometimes there's a real temptation to crank the heat up a little bit, but uh, high temperatures, fast drying, fast cooling leads to broken kernels uh, and a lower final test weight. Uh, there's a number of reports out there that in some scenarios, the corn didn't have any increase in test weight as it was dried just because it was abused. Um, also, if we have any immature kernels in particular, uh, there's a potential for scorching or caramelizing. And about the only thing we can do there is to try to reduce the plenum temperature and see if that helps us. Number of questions if we're making decisions as to what that drying cost will be. Uh, for years, we've assumed about a 2,500 BTU heat requirement to take out a pound of water. Uh, you can use that formula then where we take 0 0.022 times whatever the propane price is and it'll give us our cost per bushel per point. Uh, as we're looking at some of the more energy efficient dryers, some of the new dryers, Maybe we can do it a little bit cheaper. Uh, we'll change that to 0 0.018. However, at the colder temperatures, I'm thinking we're probably going to be closer to the 2500 BTUs rather than the 2000. So um, if we use the 0 0.02 times a dollar propane, that's about two cents per bushel per point of moisture removed. 10 points of moisture is only about 20 cents per bushel. And when you start comparing that to uh, the cost of losing corn out in the field, yes, drying is expensive, but it may not uh, be the, uh, as expensive as, as leaving 10, 15% of the corn out in the field. We're running through a lot of propane. We can make an estimate of how much propane by taking again 0 0.02 times the number of bushels times the points of moisture being removed. So in this example, if we're th drying a thousand bushels, taking off 10 points, we would estimate that we need about 200 gallons of propane. Getting calls already on test weight, uh, it seems to be uh, uh, not necessarily following the rules or what we would expect uh, to occur for most years. This table really emphasizes that the more mechanical damage that we see, the less increase in test weight that'll occur as that corn is dried. So, Normally we figure maybe a quarter to even a third of a pound increase in test weight for every point of moisture removed. However, with high moisture corn, we'll typically see more damage occurring during harvest 
and we may only see half of that uh, increase in test weight. Air drying uh, is done quite a bit. Uh, a couple of limitations there. One is the maximum moisture we can handle is 21% moisture. Uh, at these cold temperatures that we're having, the, the ability to air dry it just doesn't exist. And so at this time of the year, we're best off just cooling it to about 20 degrees holding it over winter and plan on drying it next spring when temperatures are averaging above 40. We're not likely seeing a lot of rain anymore, uh, but if we're piling the corn, uh, only a one inch rain will increase the moisture content of a foot of corn or beans by about nine percentage points. So typically when we have uh, piles of grain, as is shown in this one, you end up with a couple, three feet of spoiled grain on the top surface. Elevators can sometimes blend that off and get by. Farmers, that's gonna be a huge loss. So I discourage uh, piling corn unless we can put some type of cover on it. Uh, more information uh, up is on the web uh, and I would, uh, refer you to that site for a fair amount of information on drying corn uh, under difficult conditions. Thank you. Um, uh, Dave, are you on? Okay, Brian, why don't you take over? need a uh, kin to unshare. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. <clears throat> All right, so I was uh, I was out in Beach, Belfield, Hazen, and Jamestown wow. last couple of days, and I've seen some folks turning their animals out into standing corn. And I'm hearing, you know, some reports like uh, from Nebraska where we had a bad windstorm and a lot of corn was on the ground and uh, it's, they're being very cautious with, you know, if you've got 25 bushel per acre on the ground and they came straight off of grass of big foundering problems. So, I mean, it can be done, but just a reminder that if that's what's on your mind, uh, better take it slow and maybe just let them out there for a limited amount of time before you bring them back and then kind of get them used to it. The sharing part, let me see here. All right. So, Last last month, the uh, RMA put out <clears throat> this uh, delayed harvest for wet conditions fact sheet, and it you know lists a lot of uh, actions that can be taken. But the most important: contact your crop insurance agent and report a loss. Now, when it comes to corn, the insurance season ends about December tenth. That's for corn and soybeans. So anything that may or you may be thinking about doing before that date, a crop insurance agent needs to be consulted. They need to have calculated an indemnity or something like that beforehand before you can ever go in and do anything. The other part is, as you guys are probably aware, if it looks like you're not going to be able to harvest prior to this December 10th date, then an extension can be filed. Um, to allow enough time for you to get in there and get it harvested sometime later in the spring. I know North Dakota's dealt with this many times, but it's just a reminder you've got until December 10th to get in there and have it either uh, adjusted or, or uh, uh, file for an extension. Then after that, you know, if it's one of those deals where you deem that you need to harvest it okay, um, then uh, another deal if it's uh, basically a totally determined a crop that's not going to be harvested because of too much damage, you know, then you start thinking about all these other options, um, including just disking it under versus turning livestock out versus something else. So like I said, though, additional time to harvest, you can, uh, uh, on a case by case basis, have this, have it either settled or an extension uh, filed. And the biggest thing though, as I said, is, is this contacting your crop insurance agent. 
um, if, you, if it looks like you're not going to have it out of the field before December 10th. Um, the other thing I'm hearing on the drying um, that uh, Ken Hellevang was talking about is that there's some issues coming about on uh, shortages in propane. That there's a lot of drying going on at harvest, not just in North Dakota, but all across the plains. Uh, a late wet crop has been the rule more so than the exception. And therefore, there's high demand for propane right now. Um, I haven't heard of extraordinarily high prices being charged, but I have heard of a lot of, a lot of weights to get your, get your tanks filled so that you can continue drying. So that's something to keep an eye on or keep in mind if it's coming to a point that you might need some more or you think you need some more fuel, uh, call ahead and sort of plan ahead because they may have a backlog in terms of delivery and availability. So getting your name on the list or getting in line here soon might be, a, uh, you know, might be worth your time. And with that, I'll mute myself. Um, great, thank you. I guess we have time for questions and let me start. Uh, Ryan, so um, as I recall from a few years ago when we dealt with this issue that uh, high moisture corn is not a potential claim for insurance. In other words, if you've got 200 bushels and you've got 30% moisture corn, they make an assumption that you have 200 bushels and uh, you basically have to harvest it. That's, that's how I understand it. Now, if, unless something's changed, I believe that that's the case, that the expectation is that you're going to harvest it. And again, it goes back to a couple of things. You can let it sit in the field and dry down, file for an extension and harvest it. And if any damage happens during that extended period and you're waiting for it to dry down, well, then that's something else. Then the, or the, the other option is you, you harvest it and dry it yourself. But as I understand it, being, you know, 25, 30% moisture is not grounds for an insurance claim. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Miranda, you made a comment, uh, I think, in the chat box. Maybe you could just announce that over the... Yeah, um, so Brian touched on grazing standing corn. There was a webinar um, last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, that focused on that. So there's more information on there. If you want to watch that, um, you can go to our webpage to do that. Also, with some of the insurance questions on Tuesday, Brian Olson talked about a few of the insurance considerations based off the questions he's, the most frequent questions he's been getting from producers all across the state. And that's also posted on our website, and I can put the link to that on here for everyone. Thank you. Any questions from anyone else? Do we have any growers on that kept corn over the winter before? One thing I'll say on that, just keeping on the, over the winter, um, it's pretty common for folks, you know, down in the uh, Kansas and Nebraska area to store corn all the way through July, all the way through to July and August when it's typically shipped out on the July contract. And kind of the rule of thumb, and it does get hot down there in the summer, 100 degrees, is been, you know, you want to put it away at 15%. 15 percent has been pretty much a magic number that as long as it's put away and Ken can probably affirm that that 15 percent on corn is a, a good good number to shoot for for long-term storage. Yeah I guess I'm going to disagree with you Brian. Uh, mm -hmm. If we're going into the warmer temperatures typically today we're looking at something closer to 13 absolutely nothing over 14. Uh, a lot of that 15 came from uh, very short-term winter storage and and so uh, and if, if you're shipping early summer being May into early June maybe you can get by with 15 but anything into June and July really should be down to about 13 and a half 14 at the most and and would you put would you apply that same rule to bags too I'm even more nervous on bags. Uh, the bags will follow whatever outside average temperatures are. So for here in the northern country, we're looking at 70s to 75 degrees. As you go south, it's going to be warmer. So I would 
yeah, I tell people if it's going in a bag, target for 13. So one of the topics that we had hoped to cover uh, was that, uh, you know, field conditions and uh, the impact of keeping corn over the winter versus getting out there and harvesting, potentially making some ruts, uh, those kinds of things. Um, and um, I, I think we have a pretty good database that would suggest that these ruts uh, can become problematic areas for more than just a season. Uh, so we get anxious to get in and, and, and harvest uh, if, it's, if the soil is not in good condition and you leave a lot of ruts, those can have some longer term impacts. Uh, I think with this cold weather, probably just waiting a couple of days <laughs> might uh, resolve the, the, the problem of, of creating ruts. And then the other thing would be, you know, what happens in the spring? We got this crop out there, we eventually get it harvested. We've got a lot of residue. Uh, that's one of the blessings of corn, right, is it produces a lot of residue. And uh, then you've got the challenge of, you know, what to do with that because you've got another season on you. And, and this year we saw a lot of burning residue and, and unfortunately, you know, that was probably uh, the best practice for some of those folks because they uh, had so much residue and no way to get in until they got it uh, incorporated and we didn't really get a break in, in the weather. But I think that would be the other thing to think about. You know, what is your spring strategy? You're probably not going to want to come back with corn. I mean, that's an obvious uh, thing because uh, of uh, you probably won't be able to get in in, in a timely manner. Uh, but but you know, having a plan for what the next crop will be and and how how you're going to deal with the residue, I think, is a really important point at this point as well. Yeah, this is Ken, and I'm going to just echo some things there from previous experience, and that was that it'll depend on the, the soil that, that the corn is on, uh, and it, of course, depends on the year, but I've got quite a few pictures of guys that uh, ended up with a lot of snow banks along the edges of the field, and we need to keep in mind that... Uh, our typical snowfall is somewhere in the neighborhoods of between uh, 40 and 50 inches of snow, which translates to about four inches of water. Uh, in the spring, that's going to melt, uh, and the corn provides a wonderful shady environment to keep that ground wet. And so I had numerous guys that were calling me saying that you know, the corn is at 13% at moisture, but the field is still too wet for me to get out there and harvest. So I really encourage people to think of harvesting before spring melt uh, so that uh, that corn is off and, and harvested at least the, the majority of it before we start the spring conditions. And that has a uh, crop insurance implications too, Ken, because if you don't get the crop out before spring, you get a bunch of snow in there and we have a later spring thaw, kind of like we had last year. A field has to be available to be planted to take prevent plant as the rule stands right now. So if there's a standing crop in there and it's flooded all spring, right now as the rule stands, you cannot take prevent plant in that situation because it wasn't available to be planted because there was a standing crop. So that's uh, really, imp I know there's some folks, uh, Miranda and I have talked to uh, Brad at FSA and they're, they're bringing up that concern. But as the rule stands right now, going back to your corn example, if you leave standing corn, we get a big bunch of snow blown into the field. It stays cold, doesn't melt until April or May, and then it's too wet to get in there and pick it all the way to the end of May. Well, if we go beyond our planting window, then, then prevent plant is not an option. That's a really good point. Yeah, thanks for making it. Do we have any other questions for Joel, Ken, or Brian? All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we will reconvene on Tuesday where we'll be talking about options for swath grazing, some of the crops and forages that are unable to har be harvested. On um, Tuesday, we're going to be, or Wednesday, we'll be talking about um, access to 
um, health and stress resources in rural communities. And Thursday, we will be talking about considerations for weaning calves this fall. So Miranda, when you get the recording link, could you just send that to me? I know I can find it on your website, but I'm also, I have to do a lot of hunting. So I'll <laughs> share that with the Corn Council folks. Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Ken, Brian, we'll 